Hi, this is Jason Martell and welcome to Lesson 3. Today we're going to be talking about the Mars-Earth connection and kind of going through some of the pieces of evidence that suggest we have a much longer history than we do just on the planet Earth. It looks as if there's also a connection with the closest planet to us, Mars. Whether that be the face on Mars or various pyramids that are both on Mars and on Earth, there's also the Sphinx, which has a very strong resemblance to the face. But it also appears that there's clear evidence from various ancient cultures that discuss Mars and have it equated to a place where the gods traveled to. So let's go ahead and dive into this lesson. Now, this is from the movie Stargate that kind of postulated that the Egyptian culture was actually seeded by, uh, you know, an alien god named Ra and that there was an actual... Uh, not a city in Egypt, but an actual planet called Abydos, where there was, you know, ancient technology, and obviously this is an off-planet view. Um, so it really does bring into question a lot of the pieces that we're going to be looking at here um, for is there a connection between, you know, extraterrestrials visiting Earth, but also Mars in the past. Now, when we look at some of the edifices that we have here on Earth, obviously Egypt is a great place to start, uh, most of the monuments that we have around the world, these megalithic monuments, have one thing in common. They're aligned to star constellations. Now, why this is, is a question we'll, we'll be looking into further in these uh, ongoing lessons at ancient school. But clearly, Giza is a great example of this connection or alignment with the heavens. Giza, we know, was you know, kind of a, a lost culture as far as our modern day discovery as you can see, when we first discovered the Sphinx in the early 1900s, it was covered by sand. And it took quite a bit of excavation to actually uncover the whole Sphinx as well as the, uh, the inner wall um, that is covering the Sphinx as well. And really, this is kind of what brought the whole question of the age of the Sphinx and the pyramids into more of an academic or scientific light, simply because... Once they uncovered all of this region, they were now exposing geologic surfaces that hadn't been exposed to the sun in possibly 10,000 years. So looking at these geologic surfaces really was going to give us a lot of understanding of the actual date and age for the, the, the Sphinx and the pyramids. Now, there's been quite a bit of controversy over the Sphinx because it's supposed to be the Pharaoh Khufu, but clearly, when we look at the face of Khufu compared to the Sphinx, the angular momentum of the face and actually the nose and various parts kind of don't line up to be Khufu. They look almost African in some nature, uh, much older than, than what we currently think of the Egyptian culture at 2500 BC. It's very possible that the Sphinx and pyramids are much older than 10,500 BC, somewhere like 8,000 years older than we thought. Now, the reason why we can say that is, again, because of this geological evidence. Here we can see the modern view of the Sphinx, which looks very nice and clean and well-kept for tourism. But it's also exposing some very interesting pieces that we didn't really have access to. Now, they've also done a considerable uh, remake of a lot of the pieces here. You can see all these are all new bricks, just kind of keeping modern construction going with what the edifice showed maybe in its original form because it has been badly degraded over time. The geological evidence is really striking here on this inner wall. What we clearly see is the signs of water erosion, water that was extensively draining over the sides of the wall. And this is a, a classic view of uh, a surface, you know, a rock eroded surface by water. And we see this throughout the area in the, in the region of the Sphinx. Now, the last time that there was a great amount of rain, you know, where the, the Giza Plateau was inundated by rain was 10,000 years ago. So we know that there was, poss excuse me, 10,000 BC, which is roughly 12,000 years ago. I want to be clear on the distinction. 10,000 BC to 13,000 BC, there is postulated that there was some type of a global flood. Uh, based on other texts from ancient cultures, that seems to be the date range for the great flood that took place in our in our most recent past. But again, the 
longevity of Earth, 4.7 billion years. What's 10,000 years? It's nothing. So it looks like we had our great flood somewhere between 10 to 13,000 BC. And clearly, the geological evidence is starting to support that. Now, other areas about the Sphinx and pyramids, again, resonate with this date of 10,500 BC versus 2,500 BC. One of the main things that we look at as far as the you know, perfection of the Great Pyramid is not only its alignment on the ground, which is perfectly situated to true north-south, and is literally on the most center point of all of the land masses like put together on Earth, it, Giza, the Great Pyramid, is literally pinpointing the exact center point of our, uh, our entire land mass on Earth. So, one, they built it in a very specific location, alignment-wise, on Earth. But more even, interest, more, even more interesting, I should say, is they were able to align it to a constellation. The three pyramids from a satellite view have an exact representation of the Orion constellation. You can see the accuracy in the alignments here, but this one happens to be just slightly offset. Well, where have we seen this view before? Pretty much the Orion constellation, if you were to look up in the night sky, you'll see that it's three stars, the belt stars of Orion, perfectly aligned with the third one slightly offset. Now, this can't be by chance that using star charting software, constellation software, uh, you know, some of this is just downloadable for free, Redshift and such. You can plug into this various, you know, star charting software and find out where are the stars going to be in what position above me tonight, tomorrow night, a week from tonight, or 10,000 years ago. Okay, so we can run this model and it turns out that the Orion constellation is a perfect alignment to the three pyramids of Giza in the year 10,500 BC. It's as if the pyramids were built as a terrestrial alignment to the Orion constellation. On that specific date, they fall into alignment, 10,500 BC. Now, what's also interesting to note is that the Sphinx, at that exact date of 10,500 BC, is looking east directly into the constellation of Leo. So at 10,500 BC, we have a clear alignment where the, the pyramids are aligning with Orion and the Sphinx is lining up with the constellation of Leo. This really has to raise a lot of questions as to why the Great Pyramids align to the constellation of Orion. Now, there are other areas off-world to what we see in similarities with the Egyptian culture and areas on Mars that have similar type of edifices, whether they be pyramids or a large sphinx-like object, or a, a large face, if you will. So we really have to analyze why many of the monuments around the world are aligned to star constellations, and Giza is really a great starting point because of the very prominent alignment that it has with the Orion constellation. It's easily traced. Now, we can see that this alignment with the Orion constellation seems to be ubiquitous. It's not just with Giza. In Teotihuacan in Mexico, again, we have this alignment that takes place where it appears the great pyramids that they've built actually align with certain stars matching the Orion's belt. Not only does the star constellation match with Giza and Teotihuacan, but also what appear to be some pyramids in China. So, there could be more of a global connection with the Orion constellation as we uncover various sites that seem to have an astronomical marker. It's very prominent that many of these were interested in tracking the Orion constellation. Could this be an actual time of when the gods were appearing on Earth or traveling to Earth as when these alignments took place? Or is it simply that the gods came from that vicinity, possibly that star constellation or that, that cluster? These are very interesting questions to look at because these alignments, again, are global. Now, again, some of these things are, are off the planet Earth and still are of great interest to us because what we're clearly seeing are similarities between what's happened on Mars could possibly be what's in store for Earth thousands of years down the road. And it almost seems as if civilization at some point was connected very strongly with Mars, if not a complete 
own civilization existing on Mars in the past that possibly then transferred here to Earth? You know, we really don't know. But these are very interesting questions that we'll look into. And some of the evidence that you're going to see in today's lesson, again, raises a lot of questions. One, why is this information being withheld from the general public? But two, is there actually a longer history with other planets in our solar system that human civilizations or possibly extraterrestrial civilizations have been occupying? <clears throat> well, we know for sure that in the region of Cydonia on Mars, we have our, you know, what are clear uh, artificial structures. Now, not only are these on what appear to be an ancient shoreline, you can see that, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. Notice how all of this bright, knobby terrain seems to change in appearance and mellow out where there's not as many visible bumps and it's a darker terrain. Well, that's because this is an ancient shoreline. Now, what's interesting about this is that all of the structures, the fort, these pyramids, these possible pyramids, this one here, <clears throat> all of these pyramids appear to be right on the ancient shoreline. And the face, situated in a way where it's facing these objects as if, as if it were a, a large structure, kind of like the Statue of Liberty, or various other things that we might have as a monument that we could look out at. Let's explore that idea. Now, it's not just the face and, and, and certain objects like, you know, the pyramids that are very visible or the city. There are actually other structures, the cliff, this, this crater, um, the tholus, you know, various other things we now know have a geometric or a, or a geographic and geometric connection to each other. They're aligned in certain ways that defy nature. Now, a lot of this information was brought out by Richard Hoagland in the early two in the late 1990s and early 2000s. And again, you have to understand that these aren't just random objects that happen to be near each other. There is clearly angles that repeat mathematical constants that exist. So it's as if these buildings and, and structures were built to be in alignment with each other. Very similar to what we see with things on Earth, alignments that are taking place. Now, again, Various calculations have been shown that even the angles and ratios and, you know, the trig, the trig functions that you can clearly see here that we use on Earth are being represented in these structures on Earth. It can't be by chance that there's this much math coming out of these structures. So, you know, we really definitely want to take uh, a look at the research by Richard Hoagland. Uh, he wrote a great book called The Monuments of, of Mars, The Monuments of Mars. Um, you can also just buy these videos, which I highly recommend, and they kind of take you through all the pertinent information related to these alignments, which is, again, very intriguing. But, you know, we really have to raise the question that the city and this pyramid, the face, and some of these other structures, they weren't built by chance to be in similar uh, placement to each other. These angles just don't exist naturally uh, without a cause. So clearly we're seeing signs of a civilization that existed on Mars, but obviously this is thousands of years ago. Maybe this is at the same time frame of what we're looking at with these alignments in Giza at 10,500 BC. There's very clear possibilities of an advanced civilization that was globally all over Earth and also possibly on Mars. Now again, when we look at these structures, uh, you can see that People have speculated that they're actual, you know, complex pyramids in various shapes and sizes. And that could be the case. These have been eroded over thousands of years. And so their true shape, nature, or purpose is really kind of foreign to us. But again, we're looking at structures on another planet. And obviously, we can see similarities from what we have here on Earth as a living planet. The dead Mars still gives us signs that there was life. Now, let's really look at this ancient shoreline uh, up close for a second. You can clearly see, again, this what appears to be a landmass, where it's all bright, knobby terrain, more of a dusty look, to this water area, where it's, it's very sedimentary looking, a darker, less uh, disturbance. The topography is very clear to what we would see here on Earth 
that this slight change in topography is an actual shoreline. And the face has been situated in, in water so that these various structures, since we all love to live on waterfront property, would be situated perfectly to look out at this large edifice, which is, just so you know, 1,500 feet high and over a mile long on its longest side here. So it's not a, not a small object. But this shoreline clearly exists. Here it is from just a different angle. And again, the terrain change right along where all of these objects are, there's almost like things that would lead right into the ocean. It's very clear that these objects, if they are artificial, are conveniently built right on a shoreline. And the face is situated where it's literally angled to these objects, where it would clearly be visible as an edifice of a face, a large face being uh, seen from the shoreline. So we have to wonder if this isn't just by chance. We, we have to realize that the, the placement of these structures gives it a perfect view of this face. So there must, there must have been some great prominence for why this face was carved. And if we look into Zachariah Sitchin's book, The Lost Book of Anki, he clearly talks about why this god was banished to the planet Mars and why his followers made this large edifice of his face. So if we want to believe the evidence, the same gods that created us in their image and after their likeness, based on the Sumerian texts, were also on Mars and, and, and were, were probably responsible for that Cydonia complex. When, when this image was first transmitted live from NASA in the 1970s, they just labeled it head, right? And they just said it's a trick of light and shadow. Clear shadow defined here because the sun's probably up at this angle. But as we've seen in the last lesson, that answer did not hold up. Uh, so I really just want to stress the point that even though this face is badly damaged, we've clearly been able to extrapolate that there's data that needs to be taken under further consideration. I mean, obviously, these are sphinx-like characteristics. If you just looked at this, the similarities of it being lion-like, Egyptian-like, pharaonic-like, you know, some type of headdress, the winged disc, clearly visible, some type of, you know, Egyptian symbology embedded into this structure. There must be a connection between the Sphinx and pyramids in Egypt and the face and pyramids on Mars. So we will definitely explore this as the data continues to become available as a public view. We will continue to image Cydonia unless there's a huge public outcry like there was in the 90s where we literally picketed in front of NASA. No joke. They're not going to release a lot of images of these structures. But if the public is encouraged strongly enough to make an outcry, we can get further data. So please be aware of the missions that we're sending to Mars, because as you're going to see in these next few frames, there is critical information right in front of our nose. You just have to pay attention to it. ESA is one of the latest satellites that we have orbiting Mars, taking color photographs of the surface of the planet. Now, color is really a key word there. NASA has been sending probes to Mars for several decades. <laughs> and we never get color images. Never. That doesn't mean that they're not taking color images. They actually image the planet in a larger spectrum of light than what our human eye can process. But I think that might be for a reason. It's almost like they don't want to show us what the human eye's perspective of scenery is like on Mars. We get these scientific views of larger spectrums of light being taken in from, from the camera, but it doesn't give you the visible light range that you would see if you were on the surface of the planet. Coincidentally, most of the imagery that we get from the surface of Mars, with a simple color correction done in any imaging platform for what RGB colors we would see through the human eye, turns out Mars takes on a much interesting much more different and interesting look than we've been shown. So ESA is definitely one of the satellites that's going to help us bring more clarity into the only view that we've had up to this point, which is through NASA's lens. Now, this is the point in case number one. The Gusev Crater is a very specific region that we've been looking at on Mars. It looks like it's an ancient uh, ocean or, or, or the floor of an ocean. Lots of water was passing through this area. 
And what we've seen in NASA photographs is this. I should have put this image first, to be honest with you. This appears in the Gusev crater. And when we first look at it, we're like, huh, are these oily streaks of liquid or some type of wind that's moved these, uh, you know, the streaky lines? We really don't know. And even if we zoom in on it, you know, uh, it doesn't it doesn't really give you a lot of detail as to what you're seeing. It kind of looks like vegetation, though, like a grassy field or something. Well, turns out that when we, when we image this same area uh, using the ESA, that region is shown in color as being green. We have to wonder, folks, if why we're seeing in color on Mars actual what looks very clear structurally and color-wise to be vegetation. But NASA will only show us the black and white version. Please refute this information, NASA. If anyone from this is anyone from NASA is taking ancient school lessons, I would love to hear a blog post as to why there's only black and white data released to the public. Now sometimes we have images, imagery and images that are released from NASA that show up in the Mars Global Surveyor archives uh, or the Mars Curiosity, Mars Pathfinder, various places where you can just Google and look at the images being released by the public. These, as an interesting uh, archival find, were actually from the Viking missions in the 70s. And again, what, what we see are two things of interest here. One is the fact that there's literally there's frost on the surface of Mars. That's frozen water, folks. Snow on the surface of Mars. I mean, that, that must be significant when talking about looking for signs of life. Obviously, water is a huge prerequisite to being able to support life. Another interesting thing is, is if you take a lot of these images, even from the 70s, and just do a simple color correction for what you would see as if you were actually standing on the surface as a human, the lenses and the cameras that take the photographs take a much larger spectrum of light. When we enhance those or color correct for the human eye, this is what we see on Mars. The actual color of the snow and the actual color of the sky. Much more Earth-like. Why is this being withheld? Every once in a while on a live press conference, they'll show you a color corrected view. But this is what we normally are shown. Mars is a dead red planet. I don't think so, folks. I think all the evidence is starting to turn the other way. Mars is much more Earth-like, much more than I think we care to admit publicly right now. It might be dead as a planet that we would consider. It might still harbor life in some of these caves and things, and we'll talk about that at the end of the presentation. But clearly, we're seeing evidence here that Mars is a lot more Earth-like than we've been shown. Now, when we look at a lot of this data, color corrected, we can again see similar minerals and rocks that we have that we share here on Earth, also with Mars, that when they're color corrected, Mars again shows all the signs of being more of an Earth-like planet, from the atmosphere to the sky, again to the minerals and, and lake beds and ocean beds that we're finding. And this is really a key part, is the fact that we're finding what appear to be ancient saltwater oceans that were flowing on Mars. I'm finding evidence that shows water is still flowing on Mars today, but we just haven't publicly admitted it yet. Now, some of the evidence that they've been releasing, again, this is from 2004, they do press releases saying signs of a saltwatery sea from NASA. You know, clearly we've landed in an area that is an ancient rock bed of, of debris, like salt and sedimentary debris it covers these areas that shows water was freely flowing in these, in these various parts of Mars. We see Mars still has that ice cap in the bottom, you know, the, the top and bottom have uh, polar ice caps, but there's pretty good evidence to show that the, the water was flowing freely all over the surface of Mars, similar to what we have here on Earth. Now, when we look at various sections of this Gusev crater or other areas on Mars that they're studying, again, we see this clear evidence that there was a water flow. And they're even starting to get measurements as to how thick, of the, how thick the water level was in various spots. 
And what you can see, these little dots uh, are very clear signs of water and sedimentary debris being uh, left in this, in this type of a form. We see this all over the Earth as well as clearly now on Mars. What's interesting about this is not only are they looking at the fact that there's sedimentary debris, but every now and then, even in their just daily mundane scientific reporting, anomalies appear. This one that we're looking at here uh, is very interesting because they basically said that, you know, just a little time passed and then all of, this, all of a sudden when they looked at the imagery, this mysterious metallic, what they called, what they said looks like a jelly donut, which I think is a, a bad description. But this mysterious rock just appeared out of nowhere. And the only explanation they can give is that the tire, which you can see from the uh, the the rover that's the pod of it is here the tire track might have kicked out a piece of debris when it when they moved it about one meter but you know that's very unlikely so i'm not saying that somebody put this here and obviously it wasn't here just a little while before but it is interesting to note that there are these anomalous things even with their mundane scientific reporting that they're doing they will have to acknowledge some of the anomalies that kind of show up in their footage as things progress uh, investigating the surface of Mars. Now, I don't know exactly what this is. It does not match any of the other debris in the area. It does not look like it's a piece of the uh, rover or the lander in any way. So we kind of have to wonder what that is. Now, going back to, again, the evidence of water, there's so much imagery that we see on Mars that very closely resemble geo geologic things that we can see on Earth in comparison. I'd like to look at a few of these and show you, again, the similarities of what we see in satellite telemetry over Earth, forests and cities and lakes and such, and compare that to what we're seeing on Mars. <clears throat> we can clearly see that there's this ancient water flow, and to me, not only does this show significant signs that water was flowing here by the erosion, but possibly current water that's there now. I mean, is this actual signs of depth of water that we're looking at? I, you know, these are questions that need to be asked. Some of these photographs, I mean, they look just like a lake. What we're seeing, again, is a surface area of Mars that this, this appears to be stagnant water. Now, it might be that this ice is actually part, partly frozen water, but we're seeing clear signs of standing water on the surface of Mars. And the things around it, you know, they look almost like bacteria or some type of, you know, fungal growth or plant growth, bacterial growth, clearly, you know, similar to what we see here on Earth. Uh, we have to wonder if, you know, this imagery that we're seeing from the surface of Mars isn't exactly what it looks like actual standing water actual plant life not just like one little plant but large areas of the planet covered by plants and water why is this being withheld from the public these again are images freely available in some of the nasa archives of current footage that we're gathering from probes we're sending there now if we look at the similarities this is again from google maps and you can see standing water and the color and when we compare that to literally the same areas on Mars as far as, you know, uh, landmass and, and, and how they appear, standing water, what appears to be vegetation, there has to be some coincidence beyond just chance that we're seeing very similar geology on the surface of Mars from what we have here on Earth. Now, again, a lot of these images are freely available on the NASA archives, and I'm not sure why they're not being publicly talked about, but in my opinion, this is very primitive forms of some type of, you know, plant life. Now, obviously, we're not going to be able to confirm this until we're really exploring these surfaces up close, which, again, begs the question as to why there isn't a rover roving around in these areas or being splashed down into this water to look at this ancient uh you know lake of standing water that still exists my instincts tell me that's exactly what they're doing and the rovers that we see are just 
fluffing around in these de deserts and dry lake beds when there's actual real research going on in the more interesting locations. Again, the surface of Mars. We, we see what appear to be symmetric. Now, I'm sure these could be natural. It's very possible that these are natural, uh, eroded by sand and, 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 you know, and wind. But even looking in there, that looks like some type of a bacterial fungal growth or some type of vegetation growing. And this type of structure is very similar to what we see on Earth. Ancient cities that we know exist, that we can clearly see in satellite view all over the Earth, have these similarities to what we're seeing on Mars. Again, satellite imagery of Earth, you know, views of, of, of the same type of building structure that we have, and we see these on the surface of Mars. It's almost as if these are ancient cities or, or possibly ancient cities that existed at one time thousands of years ago. So maybe there's not just an Egyptian Mars co connection, but Incan and Mayan and Mesoamerican connections, because we really have to wonder if these aren't evidence of some type of ancient Incan city on the surface of Mars. Not discounting that these couldn't be natural phenomenon, sand and weather eroded, but again, similarities of the geography we're seeing raise a lot of questions. Now, again, some of these areas really are open for interpretation, but when we see one or two coincidences, fine. But when you get over 10 or 20, we really have to start to be a little bit more dubious about signs of evidence. Here we see what appears, appears to be just a normal outcropping from the surface of Mars, where this geological surface was actually imaged under very high resolution. So we have very good, clear data about what we're seeing. But let's look a little closer. What we see in this one little carved area is very Egyptian-like. Could there be some ancient pharaonic symbols? I mean, if you look at this again, what we're seeing are similarities to statues in Egypt. Maybe this is a trick of light and shadow, but maybe not. All the other signs of evidence say that we should start to have a more skeptical eye, a more critical eye for these things that might be a trick of light and shadow, but maybe not. We know for a fact that the Egyptians were very astute in preparing for the afterlife as well as travel to the stars. Their connections with the Orion constellations, various other monuments that they used to make these alignments, and clear you know, depictions that they did in hieroglyphic and wall reliefs where they gave very clear and concise astronomical representations of where they were during certain time periods. In Dendera, we have this huge zodiacal representation of the sky, but a sky that appears over Egypt, the, a sky that appears over Egypt thousands of years before, like 8,000 BC. They have a depiction in Dendera of what constellations were visible at like 8,000 BC. Why is that if they were existing in 2,500 BC? The only answer is that they actually have a, a longer history of information that spans these thousands and thousands of years, or this culture existed much longer than, than we think, that Egyptians' pharaonic past doesn't start at 2500 BC, but extends well into the past, 13,000 BC, something like that. Now, again, some of the evidence to support this ancient Egyptian connection with the stars is some of the clear representation of what appear to be spacecraft and shuttlecraft, speeders and helicopters. These have long been refuted as hieroglyphics that were cracked off and, and fell away. No, no, don't be told improper information. The Abydos region has lots of information from evidence of electricity in Dendera, evidence of it, you know, sophisticated craft, it's very possible that they were traveling to the stars, and the evidence we see on other planets is us traveling to other stars. So it's very possible that we do have a connection between Mars and Earth with this clear representation of a face and pyramids on Mars and the Sphinx and pyramids in, in Egypt. Uh, so interesting technology being represented by the Egyptians. Now, just a couple other points here. 
you know, some of the other ancient cultures, the most ancient one that we had record of, which we talked about in lesson one, the Sumerians, they had clear, clear uh, depictions and descriptions of how the Anunnaki were traveling between Mars and Earth. And they actually depicted, you can see here, uh, an Anunnaki with the seven dots of Earth. Remember the sacred number seven. If you're coming from outside the, our solar system in, Earth is the seventh planet. So a man from the seventh planet with our crescent moon travels on the winged disk to the planet Mars. And here's that dolphin symbol again of what we saw on Mars. Is there some connection, some watery connection between Earth and Mars in the past? Well, clearly the Anunnaki and the representation of the winged disk traveling back and forth. There's lots of evidence. The Lost Book of Anki in Zachariah Sitchin's book, The Lost Book of Anki, he clearly describes how they used Mars as a way station. The Anunnaki mining the gold and using us to mine the gold on Earth, they would then transport the gold to Mars before it made its final pass off to the planet Nibiru. So we know that there is definitely an ancient connection, a Mars-Earth connection. These depictions of the Anunnaki, again, are very similar to what we see with the various pharaohs and winged disks carried throughout Egyptian cultures. There must have been some shared knowledge of traveling amongst the stars and a connection with some of the other planets within our own solar system. Now, what we see in some of the latest reports from NASA is that there's actual caves on Mars, and it's very possible that they're so deep that this might be the prime place, the prime location for us to discover life currently on Mars. Now, obviously, until, again, they send the probes to these interesting locations, or as human beings we get to return, we're really not going to know. So last thing I'd just kind of like to point out here is, again, there might be a political reason as to why a lot of the information of certain artifacts and things that clearly suggest this Mars-Earth connection are being withheld is because NASA does have certain protocols in place, and this has been the case since the late 50s. Uh, in the late 50s, the Brookings Institute, NASA hired the Brookings Institute to prepare a very long report about what would happen if human beings were ever to interact with extraterrestrial life, if human beings ever found evidence of extraterrestrial life, and how we would handle those in society, economic, religious, even philosophical views would all be greatly impacted by the knowledge of an extraterrestrial presence. So <laughs> it's very possible that NASA, since the 50s, has just held tight to this mandate, their protocol, to quarantine this type of information and probably classify it under some random department of the Department of Defense so that it's never made public. But clearly, if anyone pays attention to what we're doing in space on just the public side, information can be learned. I definitely would recommend, as I mentioned, looking into the Lost Book of Anki. I would definitely also recommend Graham Hancock's Fingerprints of the Gods, understanding more about this alignment between the Mars and Earth connection and Orion and how this all plays into information that most of the monuments around the world are built to align to these constellations. And we're going to continue to explore that in future lessons, uh, future lessons of ancient school. Okay, so this week's homework, I recommend you check out Graham Hancock's forum. Uh, he definitely has a great deal of information that you can access. And I think I can just click on that for you real quickly here and show it to you. Um, but there's just a wealth of information that can be garnered from going through these various articles of, you know, the research that's been accumulated over the last couple of decades, looking into this connection with the stars, as well as, you know, why there's this clear evidence of uh, Egyptian culture having uh, knowledge that we definitely need to give them more credit for. Their knowledge of alignments with Orion, their their what appear to be ancient technology uses from electricity to possibly even space travel. Okay, oh, and lastly, definitely read uh, Zachariah Sitchin's Lost Book of Anki and check out the attached PDF for you know further, further information. That's, what, that's it for this week's lesson and stay tuned for next week's lesson from Ancient School.